The appeasement club at the White House, the model U.N. national security team, continues to message via leaks. This morning, they're messaging that the U.S. is said to believe Israel won't strike Iran directly, will focus on proxies instead. I don't believe any of this stuff, but what does Senator Tom Cotton think? Good morning, Senator. Welcome back. Hey, Hugh. Good morning. Good to be back on with you. So do you think that the Biden administration is whisk casting again? They're trying to influence Israeli behavior by telling them what they would prefer them to do? Um, I, I think that's what's going on, Hugh. Um, I mean, the president has a very bad habit of trying to restrain Israel, sometimes publicly, more often with these anonymous statements on background, pressuring Prime Minister Netanyahu and his war cabinet um, not to take action that Israel deems vital to its national security, first destroying Hamas in Gaza, and now responding to one of the single largest missile and drones attacks in the history of warfare. Um, you know, the president shouldn't have gone out last week and said, don't, as if a single word is a foreign policy. We saw how that worked with Vladimir Putin in 2022, only to have uh, the Ayatollahs make him look like a fool. Uh, and then he shouldn't have told uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu to, quote, unquote, take the win, as if it's a win to have 300 missiles and drones shot at your country, and certainly if you don't respond to it. And then the president, again, turned around and he leaked that immediately. All this does is, is simply project weakness and hesitancy and equivocation um, to Iran, making Iran even more likely to attack uh, more ferociously in the future. So I wouldn't presume to tell Israel how they will respond. I just I can tell you how I would respond if that happened to America. And it wouldn't be, quote unquote, taking the win as Joe Biden wants to. Now, that was is it though Neville Chamberlain came back from the Munich summit and told the Czechs, hey, take the win. It's only the Sudetenland I'm gaming up, even though, you know, what happens with appeasement? Do you think they're appeasers? Senator, am I being too hard on them to call them appeasers? Um, no, you. I think that's the generous interpretation, huh. uh, is that they're appeasers and they're cowardly and they're scared of their own shadow. Um, let me just give you an example, Hugh, of what's happening in the Red Sea um, to our own sailors. This is not happening to a bunch of foreign merchant mariners. This is happening to U.S. Navy sailors. They're sitting in the Red Sea. The Pentagon is boasting that these sailors have, quote, been in the weapons engagement envelope for more time than any ship since World War II. What that bit of bureaucratic jargon from the Navy means is they've been sitting ducks to Yemeni weapons for longer than any time since World War II. That's not a success story, Hugh. That's not a good news story. That's a failure because all this president is willing to do while those sailors are sitting ducks is to blow up missiles or drones that are in the air coming at U.S. Navy ships. Again, not, not – merchant vessels, U.S. Navy ships, or maybe blow them up when they're on the launch pad getting ready, ready to strike. He refuses to get on offense against these outlaw rebels in Yemen and blow up their manufacturing sites and their munition storage sites and their command and control centers because, again, he is fearful of escalation, just like he pussyfooted around for two years in Ukraine, fearful of escalation. When what that projected fearfulness does is just guarantee that your adversary escalates. The way, the way to avoid escalation to you is to establish what you might call escalation dominance. Uh, escalation dominance is a good term. Senator, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates took on the Houthis for years, and they did not make as much progress as they had hoped. And I don't know why that is. Would the United States be able to secure the space and then leave if it had to and invite in uh, our Sunni allies to supervise as they were once deployed there until we oblige them to leave? Well, you know, I think militarily with the right intelligence, which takes a bit of time to develop, um, and there's no question that we could destroy the war-making capability uh, of these brigands in Yemen. Um, certainly to prevent our sailors from having to just wait around like sitting ducks in these weapons engagement envelope for weeks on the end. Um, now, Yemen ha has long been an unstable country with a troubled history. America has no business going into Yemen and, and trying to stabilize it or create a some kind of democratic governance like it's Denmark or the Netherlands. But after we, with partners in the region, destroy these rebels' war-making capabilities, at least that it's, so it's no longer a threat to our sailors or our troops 
in the region or Israel and other partners in the region. I'm confident that nations like Saudi Arabia, uh, which has deep historic ties with Yemen and the United Arab Emirates, could help stabilize Yemen in some way that stops this threat to American interests. Do you understand why they weren't able to? I really don't have any idea how the UAE, which is little Sparta, according to General Mattis, and Saudi Arabia, which has got a pretty good army, how were they not able to advance upon the Houthis? Uh, well, part of it, Hugh, is that the Obama administration didn't provide the, the support that I think they should have. Because, again, you have um, so many in the Democratic Party who see the Middle East the lens of American partisan politics. And any nation that was opposed to Barack Obama's nuclear deal is viewed as wearing a red jersey. That would include Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And the, the height of that war was starting right as the nuclear, the Iran nuclear debate was happening here in America. And, and therefore, you had a lot of Democrats in the Congress putting pressure on the Obama administration not to uh, enable Saudi Arabia and the Emiratis to go for the jugular uh, against these rebels in Yemen. Um, but again, it just goes to show the, the best way to deter a threat is not to manage it carefully, not to try to gradually tinker around the edges of it, but to go for the jugular and eliminate it. Now, Senator Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, is going to bring four bills to the House floor. One is going to be for Israel. One's going to be for Ukraine. One's going to be for Taiwan. One's going to be for our industrial base. What's your advice to your colleagues in the House? Because I want them to vote for all four. Ryan Zinke just told me he doesn't think he's going to vote for Ukraine. Uh, because there's too much in it. What, what's your? I, I really don't want to waste money, but I also don't want to waste time. It, so, Hugh, I, I support all those initiatives, of course. I, I want to back Ukraine. I, of course, want to back Israel. Taiwan needs to be bolstered as well, and their own industrial base badly, badly needs improvement. I also gather they're going to include a, a new and improved version of their TikTok and foreign uh, adversary social media uh, app bill in there. That's, those are all good things. Um, I haven't seen the text of these bills. One reason uh, that I didn't care for the Senate version of the bill is that it included about uh, $19 billion of non-military aid to include billions of dollars of humanitarian aid that could have gone to Gaza at a time when Israel's still in the middle of a shooting war and Hamas is still in control uh, of how that aid is distributed. So when they're writing the final uh, content of that bill, putting aside procedural questions, I would encourage my friends in the House to look at military aid only, maybe make some or all of that military aid um, uh, in the form of loans, make sure that we're not sending aid to Hamas-controlled Gaza. Because remember, Hamas doesn't divert aid in Gaza, it accepts it. Um, and then focus especially on what we need to improve our military industrial base. Um, all these countries need these weapons now, but more than anything, they and America need America to be able to make a lot more of these weapons a lot faster going forward. So last question, Senator. The, um, the demonstrations have paralyzed the president, and he's also afraid of any disruption to oil supply raising gas prices. Do you think he, he ought to hit the refineries that Iran has, even if it hits us in the pocketbook? Because and the world oil supply is one market, if we disrupt their refining capability and hit them in their pocketbook, we'll pay part of that price. Should we do so? So the real question is, is what Israel is going to do. Israel is a nation that was attacked you. Um, I think oil refineries are an obvious vulnerability of Iran. Everyone's known that for a very long time. Another vulnerability are their drone and missile manufacturing sites, many of which are not deeply buried the way their nuclear sites are. I think the president should certainly back Israel to the hilt uh, whatever Israel decides to do to make sure that the Ayatollahs are scared straight and never undertake another attack like they did on Saturday night. What the president should not be doing is discouraging Israel from striking those refineries, like he is discouraging Ukraine from striking Russian refineries. And the reason that, Hugh, is purely political in the electoral sense. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin admitted last week, under my questioning at his hearing at the Armed Services Committee, that the Biden administration is discouraging Ukraine from striking Russian oil refineries because they don't want the price of gasoline to go up in America. They are only worried about Joe Biden's reelection and largely conducting foreign policy based on electoral college strategy, which is a complete, complete dereliction of their duty. All right. Last uh, question, which is political. Do you think the show trial unfolding in New York is going to help Donald Trump? I do. I actually think he's going to win points for this because it's so blatantly 
uh, a political prosecution and abuse of uh, process and justice. Well, well, well Hugh, it, it, it should help him because it highlights how the Democratic Party's entire political strategy this year has become the weaponization, weaponization of the legal system. Uh, the prosecutor in New York City has brought charges that the Southern District of New York, the U.S. Attorney's Office there in Manhattan, refused to bring, and that his own predecessor in New York refused to bring. It's not even clear that these charges are within the statute of limitations. He's got to cite some other underlying crime that he won't even settle on yet. So this is, this is clearly a political witch hunt that's designed to hurt Donald Trump in his, re, in his uh, election campaign. That's all there is to it. And I think every day that this trial goes on, it becomes more and more apparent. So I'm hopeful that the, the good people of New York who are seated on that jury will see through it, or at least one of them will see through it, and refuse to go along with this political witch hunt. 